these demigods are indirect, qualitative representations of the Supreme Lord. A learned scholar or devotee, however, knows who is who. Therefore, he directly worships the Supreme Lord and is not diverted by the material, qualitative representations. Those who are not so learned worship such qualitative, material representations, but their worship is unceremonious because it is irregular. So there's a few points in this verse that I would like to address. Um, one thing in modern times is that we believe that any culture in the past that worshipped the sun god, let's say, for example, that this was a, a polytheistic culture and that they were a pagan culture because they were worshipping the sun or moon or some other such representation. However, this is a very shallow understanding of what was going on in the past. In most ancient cultures before 5,000 years ago, when sun worship was going on, they were not exactly worshipping the sun, but they were worshipping the power behind the sun, who they understood was the all-powerful one, the creator of everything that be. So this modern theory, again put forth by the fraudulent scholars, that every civilization in the past who worshipped the sun or the moon was a polytheistic, uh, non-monistic uh, society that were pagans and had no true understanding of the one unified Godhead, this is absolutely false. That in most cases, in ancient religions before 5,000 years ago and in ancient cultures, the worship of the sun or moon or other powerful forces of the universe, they were actually worshipped because they're a representation of the supreme personality of Godhead. Especially the sun is the most powerful representation of the supreme personality of Godhead because it gives all light and life to everything. The Vedic uh, understanding of the sun is that in the spiritual planets, in the spiritual world, which is beyond this material world, which is full of eternity, bliss, and knowledge, as compared to this world, which is full of ignorance and anxiety and degradation, that it is not needed to be lit by any sun or moon or electric light, that the, it is lit by the effulgence coming from the Supreme Godhead. The sun is actually kind of a tear uh, a tear in the fabric of space-time that allows the effulgence from the spiritual planets to flood into this universe of material, the material universe, which is dark by nature. Therefore, it has to be lit by sunlight. It has to be lit by moonlight. It has to be lit by electricity, or we'll be in total darkness. So on a very subtle level, the sun is actually the effulgence coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and this is why the sun is so powerful, because that light coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead as it flows into this universe is able to give life and light to everything, just as the Supreme Personality of Godhead has given life to all the different living entities within both the spiritual and material universes. And the spiritual universe, the spiritual world, is also called the anti-material world because it is just the opposite of this world. For example, in that world, the people are full of eternity. In other words, they never have to die. They are full of bliss. In other words, they don't experience all the trials and the tribulations of this material world. And even if they do experience some trials or tribulations, it's what's called on a, a lila or pastime level. In other words, it's part of the spiritual ecstasy that they're feeling. They may feel some transcendental anxiety. Uh, they're... And this world is kind of a reflection of the spiritual world, a perverted reflection. Uh, Plato talked about this in his allegory of the cave, that uh, there were shadows on the wall of the cave, and that although they weren't reality, that we could understand something about reality by the form of the shadows. So in the same way, this material world, although it's a perverted reflection of the spiritual world, we can understand things about the spiritual world uh, by the shadow reflection of the material world. For example, in this world, there is personality behind everything, whether it's a government or uh, different uh, businesses or families, that everything is full of personality and that there are different personalities behind all the different functionings within the material world. This extends up to the demigod level, that there is a personality called the sun god who keeps the sun within his orbit and is 
making sure that the light and the knowledge that comes through the sun is distributed throughout the whole entire universe. Also, there is a moon god. These are some of the names that were mentioned in the verse. Um, Indra. He is the, Indra is the king of heaven. So heaven is a different concept than the spiritual world. Uh, heaven is the upper portions of the material universe, the upper planets, where the lifespan is much longer, that there isn't quite as much degradation, there isn't as much anxiety, the people are all extraordinarily beautiful, they live for vast time spans, they have incredible yogic powers, but still, because they are within the material universe, even the residents of the heavenly planets have to face death at a certain point. And based on their activities throughout their lifetime, they will either be promoted or degraded. Chandra is the moon god. So the moon god is also keeping the orbit of the moon within its uh, rotation and distributing the light of the moonlight onto planet Earth, which, according to the Vedic literatures, is very important for the production of vegetation, of the production of trees, the production of foodstuffs, is all regulated and enhanced and given their essence by moonlight. Um, Surya is the sun god. He has a very, very important, heavy task, which is keeping the sun within his orbit, within when its orbit and distributing the light and heat of the sunlight throughout the entire universe to give life to all the living entities. Let's just think about that for a second. The sun god is distributing all the power of the sun, which there are certain theories today which also confirm the Vedic literatures that the sun is one, that uh, if we look at thunderbolts of the gods and different modern theories that are coming forth in physics, that the sun in the sky is actually more of a nexus point of electrical power and that the actual power is coming from the center of the universe, that there's one central sun, and that that sunlight of the central sun is being distributed in an electromagnetic sense and in a very subtle electromagnetic sense through space-time to all the different planets uh, within the galaxy. The Vedic literature has confirmed this, that there is one central sun, and that the sun that we see in the sky is a reflection of the central sun, uh, through a, a very subtle process of manipulation of time, space, and energy, that that sun we see in the sky is a reflection of the central sun. So actually the sun god is controlling all the stars and all the suns that we see uh, orbiting all the different planets and giving them all life and light. In regards to praying to the Supreme Personality of Godhead or the divine couple, Radha Krishna, uh, we even mention in the Vedic literatures the female is mentioned first, Radha, and then the male aspect of the Supreme Godhead, Krishna, is mentioned secondarily. So as we see in this material world that the combination of male and female is the greatest creative power that they can create new life. So it's also, this is a shadow representation of what's happening on the ultimate spiritual level that the divine couple, Radha Krishna, they combine to create everything and they have different deputed agents that distribute this uh, life and light throughout the universes. If the Supreme Personality of Godhead is actually a person which uh, he must be because, just like we see in this world, every ordinary living being, they have a personality. So how is it that the supreme creator would be lacking in something that even the ordinary living entities have, which is personality? So that must be part of his feature, is that he's a person, and that she is a person. The divine couple are personalities. If they are personalities, then we can have a dialogue with them. And that is the true meaning of prayer, is to have a dialogue with the personalities of Godhead who have given us all that we have, who have given us life, who has given us light, who have given us food, who have given us a place to stay, who have given us our very essence of our soul being. Then that is the true meaning of prayer. So when we discuss prayer in the Vedic context, that is the context in which we're discussing it. A dialogue between the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his children. Just like one example is that my hand, that my hand functions in cooperation with the body. And in that way is similar to our relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We are part and parcel of the universal body. 
and that when we're connected with the whole, the hand has function, it has meaning, it has use, it serves the body. But if the hand becomes cut off, then the hand has no more meaning. It will just lay there dead. So prayer or the dialogue between the individual spirit soul and the supreme personality of Godhead is one of the is main ways that we connect, stay connected to the universal whole. So we have to try to start looking within our heart and opening up that dialogue. Um, we'll move on to text 35 now. Sri Sutta Goswami said, The personality of Kali, thus being ordered by Maharaj Parikit, began to tremble in fear, seeing the king before him like Yamaraj, ready to kill him. Kali spoke to the king as, fo as follows. Purport. The king was ready to kill the personality of Kali at once, as soon as he disobeyed his order. Otherwise, the king had no objection to allowing him to prolong his life. The personality of Kali also, after attempting to get rid of the punishment in various ways, decided that he must surrender unto him, and thus he began to tremble in fear of his life. The king, or the executive head, must be so strong as to stand before the personality of Kali, like the personality of death, Yamaraj. The king's order must be obeyed, otherwise the culprit's life is in risk. That is the way to rule the personalities of Kali, who create disturbance in the normal life of the state citizens. So we can see that this is in direct contrast to the modern leaders who let every type of, and form of perversion and subversion and destruction and unrighteousness exist within their kingdom through the forms of crime, abortion, rape, uh, drug abuse, gambling, every form of intoxication. All these things are actually encouraged by the state in order to keep the people in a degraded consciousness that so they can be easily controlled and manipulated, just like we see in modern politics. That whether it's George Bush or whether it's Barack Obama, they're supposed to be the two opposite sides of the coin, but yet the same agenda is pushed forward. Unrighteous wars, destructive economic policies, leniency against criminals, the encouraging of abortion and divorce, the encouraging of a secular state with no connection to any type of righteous principles. So this is set up as a game that they play to keep us bewildered, um, almost because they've gotten us into kind of a sports consciousness. They frame everything in kind of a one team versus another team, and that absorbs our mind and our consciousness. And every time we get tricked, when we get sick of George Bush and the Republicans because they've done us so wrong, then we elect all Democrats to come in. And then when they do us wrong and they drag us down further, then we swing back to the Republicans. So they're playing the game of the Hegelian dialectic of having two opposing sides that we always flip-flop between, but we never get down to the essence that the same program is pushed forth by either side. 